problem. We have a jobs and a tax problem. History okay. teaches us Reaganomics is a failure. Facts matter. All of this in our video library at cspan.org. The U.S. House has gaveled back in to begin debate on a bill requiring President Obama to submit to Congress a proposal for balancing the budget over the next 10 years. Live coverage here on C-SPAN. Speaker May, pursuant to Clause 2B of Rule 18, declare the House resolved into the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for consideration of the bill, H.R. 444, to require that if the President's fiscal year 2014 budget does not achieve balance in a fiscal year covered by such budget, the President shall submit a supplemental unified budget by April 1, 2013, which identifies a fiscal year in which balance is achieved and for other purposes. The first reading of the bill shall be dispensed with. All points of order against consideration of the bill are waived. General debate shall be confined to the bill and shall not exceed one hour equally divided among and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the committee on the budget or their respective designees. After general debate, the bill shall be considered for amendment under the five-minute rule. The bill shall be considered as read. All points of order against provisions in the bill are waived. No amendment to the bill shall be in order except those printed in the report of the Committee on Rules accompanying this resolution. Each such amendment may be offered only in the order printed in the report, may be offered only by a member designated in the report, shall be considered as read shall be debatable for the time specified in the report, equally divided and controlled by the proponent and an opponent, shall not be subject to amendment, and shall not be subject to a demand for division of the question in the House or in the Committee of the Whole. All points of order against such amendments are waived. At the conclusion of consideration of the bill for amendment, the Committee shall rise and report the bill to the House with such amendments as may have been adopted. The previous question shall be considered as ordered on the bill and amendments thereto to final passage without intervening motion, except one motion to recommit with or without instructions. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized for one hour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And for the purpose of debate only, I'd like to yield the customary 30 minutes to my friend from Massachusetts, Mr. McGovern, uh, pending which I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman's recognized. The, uh, during consideration of this resolution, uh, Mr. Speaker, all time is yielded for the purpose of debate only, and I'd like to ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we're here today, as you heard from the clerk, Mr. Speaker, on uh, House Resolution uh, 48, which provides a structured rule for consideration of H.R. 444, which is the Require a Plan uh, Act. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this is a a, a resolution that will require that the president, if he doesn't submit a budget that ultimately comes to balance, uh, submit then a supplementary budget uh, that shows how he would bring the budget to balance. As you know, Mr. Speaker, we've been grappling with serious uh, budget uh, challenges uh, throughout uh, this president's administration. Uh, we go back to FY 2009, the very first year of the administration, the deficit tripled the previous record high uh, deficit in this country to $1.4 trillion. It's $1.3 trillion in FY10, $1.3 trillion in FY11, $1.2 trillion in FY12. And Mr. Speaker, there's no plan that the administration has produced uh, to get us uh, from where we are, fiscal irresponsibility, to a point uh, in the future of fiscal responsibility. Mr. Speaker, we've been doing our part here in the House. We've been proud to work together across the aisle in order to pass budgets that tackle those hard challenges that are ahead of us. If you go and you read the, uh, the President's uh, comments, uh, Mr. Speaker, you'll see that he recognizes the challenges are, are hard. The question is, are we going to deal with those or not? I, I hold here, uh, Mr. Speaker, a, a speech that the President uh, made to the Democratic National Convention on September 6, 2012 where he said this, I will use the money that we're no longer spending on war to pay down our debt and put more people back to work. And my notes here said it was followed by extended cheers and applause. I suspect my friend from Massachusetts uh, supports that uh, uh, spirit wholeheartedly, that I will use the money we're no longer spending on war to pay down our debt and put more people back to work. 
But, Mr. Speaker, I also hold in my hand a transcript from the Budget Committee on which I have the pleasure of, of sitting when we had the President's Treasury Secretary come before the Budget Committee to explain the President's budget. And I said this. I said, can you tell me just in simple terms, in true or false terms, does this budget never, ever, ever reduces the debt? Is that right? Treasury Secretary Geithner, uh, that is correct. It does not go far enough to bring down the debt, not just as a share of economy, but overall. You're right. It doesn't bring down the debt at all. Mr. Speaker, that's the conflict that we face here as a people, as a country, not as Republicans, not as Democrats, but as a people. On the one hand, what our politicians are saying is we're going to use the money to pay down our debt. But what the reality is, is that proposers are coming out today that never, ever, ever pay down a penny of debt. Now, Mr. Speaker, if you want to see that for your for yourself, you can look. You know, the, the president's uh, budgets each year are posted online on the OMB uh, website. In fact, the very first one he submitted, uh, I hold the cover page here, it was called A New Era of Responsibility. A New Era of Responsibility is the first budget the, the president ever submitted. But as I go through that budget, Mr. Speaker, what I see is projections for 2020, for 2030, for 2040, for 2060, and for 2080. Mr. Speaker, hear that. You've got young children, 2020, 20, 2030, 20, 2040, 20, 2060, 20, and 2080. And in each one of those years, according to the President's budget, not only does the budget never balance under his plan, but it continues to get worse. 2020, 2030, 2040, 2050, 2060, 2080. The President's budget. And I think that comes as news to so many of us. Mr. Speaker, I confess, because I've listened to all the speeches, just as my friend from Massachusetts has, where we talk about getting the deficit under control, where we talk about paying down the debt. Only when you get into the plan do you see that we never pay down one penny. So this rule today, Mr. Speaker, would allow us to take up a bill that would require the president, for the very first time, to submit a balanced budget. Doesn't have to balance the way I would balance it, doesn't have to balance the way you would balance it, but to submit a balanced budget. And if he does not, within the current statutory time, and as you know, Mr. Speaker, the statute actually required that the president submit his budget yesterday. He's going to miss that uh, deadline, but I, I'm expecting it uh, soon, and I'm, I'm looking forward to, to reading it soon but that we actually give the American people a plan. And I, I want to say, because we heard it in the Rules Committee last night, and I believe my friend from Massachusetts brought it up, and he was absolutely right. The history of deficits and debt in this country, Mr. Speaker, is not a mark of shame on the Democratic Party, and it is not a mark of shame on the Republican Party. It is a mark of shame on all of us collectively. And candidly, you and I here, Mr. Speaker, in the big freshman class of 2010, I'm less interested in finding out who to blame, and I'm more interested in finding out who has a solution to solve the problem. This House passed a solution to solve the problem. I'd like to see the Senate create a solution. I'd like to see the pre President create a solution. I'd like to see us discuss that solution as the American people, Mr. Speaker. There are 14 amendments uh, submitted to this uh, piece of legislation, uh, Mr. Speaker. We heard testimony on that in the Rules Committee uh, yesterday. Unfortunately, six of those 14 amendments were non-germane. We were not able uh, to make those in order, but we did make in order three Republican amendments, one Democratic amendment, and one bipartisan amendment. In fact, all the members who came to the Rules Committee yesterday to testify on behalf of their amendments, we were able to make those amendments uh, in order. Mr. Speaker, all this bill does, should it become law, is require that if the president doesn't submit a balanced budget, it's certainly my great hope that he will, but if he doesn't, he share with the American people, again, not in five years, not in ten years, whatever number he believes is the right way to, to set priorities. Tell the American people what steps he will take to get us back on track. Candidly, Mr. Speaker, it's 
it's unconscionable that we can look at projections going out to 2080 and have folks never, ever, ever pay down one penny of debt. Contrast that, contrast that with what we did here in the House of Representatives, where with the budget that passed this House, the bipartisan vote that passed that budget, passed the only budget that passed anywhere in this town, not only would we have balanced the budget in that time frame, Mr. Speaker, we would have paid back every penny of our $16.4 trillion federal debt. That's no small conversation. It's a conversation that's long overdue on this House floor. It's a conversation that has been too long ignored by both Democrats and Republicans. And I'm pleased to be here today uh, to take that up with my friend from Massachusetts and then later on the underlying bill. And with that, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Georgia reserves. The gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the gentleman from Georgia, my good friend, uh, for yielding me the customary 30 minutes. And I ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks, and I yield myself such time as I may consume. Without objection, and the gentleman is recognized. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, I urge my colleagues to vote no on this restrictive rule and uh, to vote no on the underlying bill. The process here is awful. The bill before us was, was not even considered by the Budget Committee. They didn't hold a single hearing, no markup. And on a party line vote last night, the Rules Committee denied Mr. Van Hollen, uh, uh, the ranking member of the Budget Committee, the opportunity to offer a meaningful substitute. The Rules Committee also, on a party line, voted against an open rule. To all of the Republican freshmen and sophomores who campaigned on the need for openness and transparency, by voting for this rule, you are officially part of the problem. This bill before us isn't a meaningful attempt to address the budget. It's a gimmick wrapped in talking points inside a press release. Two weeks ago, this House passed the so-called No Budget, No Pay Act. Then they went on another recess. There wasn't a holiday, mind you. I guess it was the Super Bowl recess. Now they're back with today's bill. It calls on the President to tell Congress when his budget will come into balance. If his budget doesn't say when it will come into balance, then he must submit a supplemental statement telling Congress when it will come into balance. Why are we doing this? Because the President is late submitting uh, his budget for the next fiscal year. Okay, fine. The President should submit a budget on time, and I support that. But lost in all of this Republican budget kabuki theater is the truth. The reason the administration is late with their budget is because they just spent months trying to avert the, avert the disaster that was the fiscal cliff. As the Speaker was trying in vain to corral House Republicans into doing the right thing, we had Plan B and Plan C and Plan who knows what. Finally, we reached a deal on January 1st, technically after we went over the cliff. In the meantime, back in the real world, we are less than 24 calendar days away from the disastrous sequester for, for taking effect. Less than 24 calendar days from massive, arbitrary, and devastating cuts to defense and non-defense discretionary programs. Cuts to jobs programs and medical research and education. Cuts to military personnel and law enforcement. Cuts that will cost jobs and do real harm to the American economy as it struggles to recover. And the reality is that we don't even have that much time. We only have nine legislative days left in February to address the issue. Nine days to negotiate a trillion dollar deal with the Senate and the President. And instead of a meaningful plan to address the crisis that we, we, that we need to avert, we have this nonsense before us today. This is no way to govern. The disturbing truth is that many Republicans seem downright giddy when it comes to the sequester cuts. There is new story after new story about how the re Republicans are going to allow the sequester to take effect. In the Rules Committee last night, the author of this bill, the gentleman from jo Georgia, Dr. Price, couldn't support these cuts fast enough. I was shocked. Mr. Speaker, it was only last week that the economic numbers for the fourth quarter of 2012 were released. Unexpectedly, we saw a contraction in those numbers, a contraction fueled by a massive reduction in defense spending. What do you know? Huge cuts in government spending during a fragile economic re recovery damage economic growth. The Republican response is to double down on this stupid. These Republican games of Russian roulette with the American economy must come to an end. 
it is time to replace short-term partisan political interests with the greater good. Now, the President today is asking us to consider a thoughtful, balanced plan to stop the sequester. I urge the Republican leadership to bring that plan to the floor of the House for a vote as soon as possible. That's what the American people want, and that's what they deserve, a real plan. The bill before us today isn't it, and I urge my colleagues to reject it, and I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Massachusetts Reserve, the gentleman from Georgia, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the, my friend from Massachusetts uh, because he's highlighting exactly what our challenges are and exactly why it's so important that we pass uh, both the rule and H.R. 444 today. I mean, it, it, he went through item after item after item that have absolutely tied our economy up in knots short-term problems and short-term solutions are trumping the discussion of long-term problems and long-term solutions. You know, the, the sequester that he mentioned, Mr. Speaker, you know, it was the month of May last year that this House first passed a replacement to the sequester? Now, as you know, and as history has recorded, the Senate never acted on any replacement of a sequester. And now we talk about what happened on January 1st as if it was something that was created by this House, as if that, that uh, uh, fiscal cliff was something that, that this House uh, invented. In fact, we have a very proud history, bipartisan history, of looking further down the road to try to find the best answers and the best solutions to very serious problems. But we can't do it alone, Mr. Speaker. You know, one of the great uh, successes we've had just early in this year, and by we I mean this entire House, the People's House, is that we appear to have persuaded the Senate to pass a budget for the first time in four years. All indication is that this year, unlike last year and the year before that, the year before that, this year, they're going to pass a budget to lay out their plan. But what does it say, Mr. Speaker, about this House, about this process, about the future of this country, that it's controversial whether or not the President of the United States should introduce a budget that balances ever? Ever. That's the debate today, Mr. Speaker. That's how out of touch Washington has become. That's how confused uh, the, the speeches uh, have been written. We're debating whether or not the president should introduce a budget that ever balances. I'm advocating yes, he should. And others are advocating no, that shouldn't be a requirement. When you take the oath to fully execute the laws of the land, when you take the oath to faithfully protect and defend the United States of America, it shouldn't be a requirement that you balance budgets. In fact, you should be free not just for 10 years, not just for 20 years, not just for 40 years, not just for 80 years, but forever to deficit spend, to borrow from a generation of children and a generation of grandchildren to pay for our wants today, taking away from their needs tomorrow. It's controversial, Mr. Speaker. We're going to argue about it. This debate's going to come to a close in, in 40 minutes. We're going to vote on a rule. Then we're going to go into the rule passes, go into a vote on the underlying bill. There are going to be no votes on the board that say no. The president should never have to explain to the American people how we're going to make our fiscal tomorrow better than our fiscal today. I'd like to change his mind, Mr. Speaker, but for now I'm going to focus on changing the minds right here in this chamber because if there is anything that unites us in this body rather than divides us, it is a true love of this country. And I challenge anyone, Mr. Speaker, to define their love of our freedoms and of our country in a way that allows us to continue borrowing from the next generation forever. I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Georgia reserves. The gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself so much time as it may consume. Uh, I'd like to um, 
uh, submit for the record a, a letter sent to the Honorable Paul Ryan, the Chairman of the C Committee on Budget from the Executive Office of the President and the Office of Management of Budget, which explains why the President's budget uh, for this year is delayed because of the theatrics that uh, my friends on the other side uh, forced us to go through to avoid going over a fiscal cliff. So I think, uh, I think it's understandable why the budget may be a little late. And I would say to the gentleman, um, submitting a budget is not controversial. What is controversial to me um, is the fact that so many friends, my friends on the other side, want to go over this sequester cliff in which millions of jobs will be lost. That to me is controversial. We, sh we should be about protecting jobs and creating jobs. Uh, my friends have plans, budgetary plans, that would throw people out of work. And I find that unconscionable. I find that unconscionable. We should be about lifting this country up, not trying to put people down. And the plans that have been proposed by my friends on the other side, including this kind of giddiness about the prospect of going over the sequestration cliff, uh, would, would cost millions of people in this country jobs. It would hurt our economy. That's not the way we want to govern. That's what is controversial on our side. We don't want people to lose their jobs. We want people to keep their jobs, and we want to create an economy that creates more jobs. Mr. Speaker, at this time, I'd like to yield three minutes to the gentleman from New York, uh, the ranking member of the Rules Committee, Ms. Slaughter. The gentleman from New York is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I certainly thank my friend for yielding. Um, Mr. Speaker, I do love my country, uh, and my country is begging me, as I'm sure it is all other members of Congress, to for heaven's sakes get some of this taken care of and have some certainty. Uh, talking with constituents just this morning, they were saying they simply don't know what to do. Uh, and what we're doing here again is just theater, as my colleague pointed out. This isn't a plan. It's a gimmick. And it wastes the valuable time. Now, CBS News reported last year that it cost $24 million a week to operate the House of Representatives. And on behalf of the taxpayers who pay those bills, we should be debating some serious legislation and come up with serious answers to our nation's procedures. And everybody has known from their grammar school days that the way we pass a bill is that the House proposes a bill, the Senate proposes a bill. They go through the committee processes. They are passed on through the committee, the subcommittees, then the major committee, then to the rules committee in our case. And then we have a conference and we send it to the president. We don't do that anymore. The last two bills we've dealt with on this floor just came directly to the rules committee. There was no committee action whatever. There was no discussion. There was no input. And yesterday on this one, what really, I think, grieves me most is that there was a wonderful substitute put forward with great sincerity by the ranking member of the Budget Committee, Mr. Van Hollen. Now, I think he's respected by all sides and most of this country for his wisdom and for his acuity. But could they put his substitute in order? No. They said they had to have a waiver. Well, that's what the Rules Committee's for. It's what the Rules Committee does. Budget Committee itself has had 18 at least waivers in the last uh, term. I, it, it just defies imagination. But this is $24 million again this week, where we're brought in from all the corners of the United States at expense to stand here and do absolutely nothing. If they want to know what the president wants to do, they should call him up and ask him. We don't have to do res a resolution or a bill on the floor of the House to find that out, if that's so important. What a crazy thing that we could do in this time of communication to say this is the way. We're going to try to find out something. And find out what? The drastic across-the-board spending cuts are going to take effect on March the 1st. Now, week after next, we're taking another week off. We work about two and a half days here. It's really, um, it's really unfortunate. I think I, I can use that word without being called down, but I, I have much stronger ones in my head. But instead of solving that looming crisis, again, they propose legislation that tries to change the subject. Try as they might, they can't hide from the fact that they are failing to provide help when American people need it most. Mr. Speaker, we are days away from a serious self-inflicted wound. May I ask for some extra time? Uh, the gentleman an extra, extra two? two minutes. Thank you so much. The gentleman from New York is recognized for an additional Thank two you. minutes. 
If the pending sequester were to take effect, there would be such drastic cuts to important programs, not only domestically, but as you heard Leon Panetta, the Secretary of Defense, say, it would hollow out the military and leave our military fighting with one hand tied behind its back. Why would we do that? For no earthly reason. Why in the world would we put the United States through that? Taken together, the cuts, as was said before, would destroy jobs, reforce our economic recovery, just reverse it, and destroy the middle class. To get a glimpse of what drastic spending cuts would do to our economy, just look back to the end of 2012. As leading economists, the White House Council of Economic Advisors and President Obama have all pointed out, the drastic spending cuts at the end of last year are the leading causes, the leading causes of our recent economic stagnation. Should the sequester take effect, our economy would suffer even more and jobs would be lost as deeper and deeper spending cuts take effect. Is that the path the majority wants to walk down? Because if they keep spending our time debating stupid legislation like this, we're going to find ourselves on that path before too long. I agree with Mr. McGovern that I, many of our colleagues seem to want to go off that cliff for some kind of foolish exercise knowing full well what is going to happen, and that is really shameful. Yesterday, our Democrat colleagues and I proposed legislation that would stop this sequester with Mr. Van Hollen's substitute, but no, they would not do that. It was simply cross the side. The majority chose to move forward with this restrictive and partisan process, closed rule again, that ignores the, the problems before us and moves forward with a political gimmick. As the clock continues to tick, I urge my colleagues to stop those gimmicks and get back to work. Again, uh, the people I spoke with just today are saying over and over again, some certainty has to be in this government. People have to know what the economic situation is going to be. We do not want to play Russian roulette in here with the American economy day after day and week after week. I urge my colleagues, stop wasting the valuable time and let's provide that certainty and yield back the balance of my time. The generally yields back the balance of our time. Without objection, the documents introduced by the gentleman from Massachusetts will be included as part of the record. The gentleman from Massachusetts reserves the gentleman from Georgia is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I just want to say to my friend from New York, for whom I do have tremendous respect and, and value her counsel, uh, to call this a stupid piece of legislation, I, I think really misses the point about, about what we're doing here. It, I'd encourage you to ask your constituents in, in New York, Mr. Speaker, I'd encourage you to ask your constituents back home, do folks realize, because I didn't, that in the four years that the President has been President of the United States, the budgets that he has introduced come to balance never. Now, my, my friends on the other side are making a persuasive case, Mr. Speaker, for why it is they would support doing things with different priorities than I would support doing things. And that's absolutely going to be true. When we debate the budget resolution, we're going to have different approaches for getting the balance. But the President's budgets never get there. If we give him every spending cut he asks for, if we give him every tax increase he asks for, if we do absolutely everything that the budget that he is required by law to submit requests, we will begin to pay down the first penny of debt never. In fact, if we do absolutely everything that the budget he is required by law to submit to us asks, the debt will continue to grow forever. I, I agree with so much of what my friends on the other side are, are saying about the sequester, about the fiscal cliff. That's why we acted in May in this body. That's why we acted in August on this body on the tax bill. That's why we passed another sequester replacement in, in August. That's why we passed another one uh, in December. I agree. But can't we also agree that if you're going to be commander-in-chief of America, if you're going to be the President of the United States, if you're going to uphold and defend the Constitution, and we have our former Joint Chiefs of Staff Chairman telling us that our greatest national security threat is our growing debt, shouldn't it be fair to ask the President to tell us when, if ever, 
he plans to begin paying back the first penny. Mr. Speaker, it's not a stupid piece of legislation that we're dealing with today. What's almost laughably ridiculous is that it's controversial. Would, would the gentleman yield? The, uh, I believe the gentleman has much more time than I would. I'll be happy to reserve the balance of my time, though, and, and, and uh, allow my friend to control. The gentleman from Georgia Reserves, the gentleman from Massachusetts, is recognized. I yield the gentleman general from New York uh, two minutes. I, I see a number of my colleagues have come in to speak, so I'm going to be as brief as I can. But uh, I know that the chair of the Budget Committee has said that he can uh, balance the budget in 10 years. Uh, which most economists and people say would certainly throw us into the worst depression, worse than 1929. I believe that what we're doing here, I can't prove it, but my suspicions are that this is something intended to cover that. They're trying to get the president into that trick box or something to try to do the same thing. Don't go, Mr. President. We can do better than that. Uh, thank you very much. I yield back. No, and uh, Mr. Speaker, may I give myself such time as may consume? Gentlemen's recognized. Yeah, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the issue is not whether the president should submit a budget. Uh, he should, and, and he would have submitted a budget by now, but because of the theatrics that my friends on the other side put us through uh, dealing with the fiscal cliff, which was just solved uh, on January 1st, things are a little bit delayed. But the issue is, is, is why is the House wasting time on this while the sword of the sequester hangs over the American people? Uh, you know, uh, the uh, president can submit any budget he wants. Any, that's what the president has the right to do. Just like George Bush submitted whatever budget he wanted to do. We have a job here in this House, uh, and that is to address this looming uh, fiscal crisis called the sequester. And what we're doing here today is doing nothing at all to move that ball forward. You know, in less than a month, arbitrary cuts are going to go into effect and people are going to lose their jobs and this economy is going to go into a deeper slump. And for the life of me, I can't understand why there's not more urgency. Uh, I, I mean, we, we, we shouldn't be taking vacations. We actually, we actually should be working here and trying to resolve this. Yet instead, we're bringing these, uh, these this, this, this is stupid legislation because it is not addressing the crisis. It is doing nothing to advance the cause of trying to get to a solution. This is just a press release. This is just yet another gimmick. And I think the reason why Congress, and especially the House of Representatives, is held in such low regard is because we spend so much time on trivial matters, debating passionately, and we skip over debating the important things. We ought to be doing something important here today. We ought to be trying to avert this, sequest this, this sequestration. We ought to be trying to keep people in their jobs. We ought to be trying to create an economy that will create more jobs, not this, not this theater. I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Massachusetts reserves. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And there's, a, there's a reason that we're spending so much time talking about things other than the underlying bill, other than the rule. And the reason is because the rule's a good rule and the bill's a good bill. And we can use this time for the political theater that my friend from Massachusetts uh, uh, appears to disdain. But I would say he's got talent for it and he should not disdain it so, so rapidly. Mr. Speaker, we handled the sequester in May. I hope whenever he's, uh, my friend from Massachusetts refers to his friends on the other What's side, the he means the other side of the chamber. Uh, not the other side of, of, of this House, the, the, the because Germany, we, no, you and no. I, acted, the, Mr. Speaker, the, the, to Germany, this solve is the, those issues. This is the 113th Congress. I'd be happy to yield to yeah, my I, friend. I, I think this is the 113th Congress. We haven't done one thing to solve this fiscal crisis coming, that's looming on March 1st. This is the 113th Congress. Under the Constitution, when a new Congress begins, re we have to start all over again. Reclaiming okay? my time, yeah. my friend is exactly right. Of all of the multiple efforts that we did last year that were all rejected by the other side, we have not recreated those efforts again this year. He's exactly right. What we have done, however, is created a pathway that's going to produce the first budget on the Senate side, the first opportunity for the bodies to, to come together in conference. My friend from New York tells us about I'm just a bill and what school children are learning all over America. Mr. Speaker, they're going to have to learn it on TV because they have not seen it in this town. We can't. We can't go to conference on a budget unless the Senate passes one. And this year, this year, Mr. Speaker, as governed by the rule book, the United States Constitution that I have right here in my hand, we're going to be able to get that done. That's the kind of work this House is doing. That's the groundwork that we're laying. And my friend from New York is exactly right, Mr. Speaker. When she says that this body led by Chairman Ryan on the Budget Committee, is going to produce a budget so serious 
and so responsible, it's going to come to balance the balance that the American people are demanding faster than any other budget we have seen in this president's administration. All we're asking, Mr. Speaker, doesn't it seem reasonable to let the president submit any budget he wants to? Don't want to change the budgets he's submitting at all. But just to share with the American people because they don't know when they come to balance. Who knew, Mr. Speaker, when the budget was entitled a new era of responsibility that it wasn't going to come to balance in 80 years? Who knew? I didn't. There are people in this chamber, Mr. Speaker, who did not know that in four years of his presidency, this president has never, ever, ever, assuming a world where he gets everything that he wants, crafted a plan that begins to pay back the very first penny of our debt. That's dangerous, Mr. Speaker. This bill, this bill, can put a stop to that process. That's why I know it's going to get support here in the House. Reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Georgia reserves. The gentleman from Massachusetts. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This bill, does, this bill does nothing. It does absolutely nothing. It's a press release. And, Mr. Speaker, if we defeat the previous question, I will offer an amendment to the rule to ensure that the House votes on Mr. Van Hollen's uh, replacement for the sequester, which was blocked yesterday in the Rules Committee. My friend from Georgia talks about this being a good rule. Um, this, this is and a good process. This bill was, refer was not even considered by the Budget Committee, which is the Committee of Jurisdiction. It had no hearings, had no markup. It mysteriously appeared at the Rules Committee. And, and we, want, we wanted an open rule. We would deny an open rule. Mr. Van Hollen actually had a substantive amendment to uh, replace the sequester. That was denied. So I want to yield to discuss his amendment. Five minutes to the gentleman from Maryland, the ranking member of the Budget Committee, Mr. Van Hollen. The gentleman from Maryland is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my colleague, uh, Mr. McGovern, uh, who said it exactly right. Uh, this, unfortunately, is another uh, political gimmick uh, we've seen from our Republican colleagues, and it is exactly why the American people hate this Congress so much. Uh, rather than doing something to create jobs, rather than doing something to help uh, support the economy, uh, this does absolutely nothing other than point fingers at the president uh, because his budget is a little late and then tell the president that he has to submit a budget that meets the Republican requirements rather than we've, we've done with every other president which give them the ability to present the budget they like. Now with respect to the delay, our Republican colleagues know very well what the cause of that delay was. The cause of the delay was we were working very hard to try and avoid the fiscal cliff which would have hurt jobs and the economy. I'm not surprised some of our Republican House colleagues have forgotten about that because they overwhelmingly voted against the fiscal cliff agreement, which, by the way, was supported by the overwhelming majority of Senate Republicans. But here on the House, Republicans in great numbers said that they would rather risk the economy and risk jobs than ask the very, very wealthiest Americans to pay a little bit more. And that's why the fiscal cliff agreement took so long. We didn't get it done until January 2nd. Now, I would hope my colleagues on the Budget Committee know that if you're putting together a budget, you need to know what you're spending, but you also know, need to know what your revenues are. And until we were able to get that agreement, the President didn't know what the revenues were. Now, nonpartisan groups like the Congressional Budget Office and Joint Tax, they were also delayed in their assessment. Nonpartisan groups. Now, the shame of it is Instead of playing these political games, we should do what my colleagues have said we should do. We should be focused on avoiding the sequester, the meat acts across the board cuts. And this House has taken no action in this Congress, in this 113th Congress, to deal with that. And so we on the Democratic side said, hey, let's give our members an opportunity to vote on something, to replace the sequester, to do it in a balanced way so that we don't hurt the economy and that we don't put jobs at risk. And so we brought a substitute amendment to the Rules Committee that would have prevented those across the board cuts, would have replaced them with balanced and sensible alternatives, like, for example, eliminating direct payments and agriculture subsidies, like getting rid of the tax 
payer subsidies for big oil companies, that we would replace the across-the-board meat tax cuts that will do great harm to our economy with those sensible measures. And the response from our Republican colleagues, you don't get a vote. You don't get a vote. They rush to the floor a measure that hasn't had a single hearing, that did not go through the regular order, and in keeping with that philosophy, we don't even get a vote. A vote on something that is important to the American people, which is to replace the across-the-board sequester, which we know is going to hurt jobs, because we just heard from the last quarter economic report that even the fear of those across-the-board cuts was having a damaging impact on the economy. Even the fear of it. And now, within less than a month, it's going to happen. And here we're, we're, we're talking about a political gimmick bill instead of something that does something real. And not even allowed a chance to vote on a proposal to replace the sequester. Vote against it if you want. Vote against it. That's the way the democratic process works. But allow this House to work its will. When this House worked its will, we were able to get a fiscal agreement passed and avoid going over the cliff and hurting the economy. Well, let's do the same thing now. Let's just have a vote, up or down, on the merits of a substitute proposal rather than playing games uh, with this very unfortunate proposal that does nothing uh, but play politics. And with that, uh, Mr. Speaker, I uh, yield the balance of my time and thank my colleagues uh, on the Rules Committee. The gentleman from Maryland yields back. The gentleman from Massachusetts reserves. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized. The, Mr. Speaker, I yield myself 30 seconds just to say to my friends, Gentlemen's I haven't ready. actually mentioned that the president's budget uh, was late. Uh, you're exactly right. He did miss his statutory deadline. He's not going to uh, make it on time. In fact, the, the story is it's not going to get here until March, Mr. Speaker. In the years that I've had a voting card, he's never submitted a budget on time. I'm not asking him to get it here on time. I'm only asking him when it gets here. Would he tell us when it's going to balance? And with that, I'd like to yield four minutes to my friend from Texas. The gentleman from Maryland will suspend. The gentleman from Maryland will suspend. The gentleman from Maryland will suspend. The gentleman from Georgia controls the time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'd like to yield four minutes uh, to a colleague on the Rules Committee, uh, the gentleman uh, from Texas, Dr. Burgess. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for four minutes. I thank the gentleman for yielding. And this is, this is an important discussion that we're having today, and I urge my colleagues to vote for the rule and vote for the underlying bill that follows. Look, the President's going to be here talking to us next week. He'll deliver his State of the Union address. He will do so without a plan on the, uh, on the table. There will be no budget. We will not know about the proposals that are put forward as to whether or not they're reasonable in the context of outlays and allocations. We just simply don't know. Now, the underlying bill that's been being discussed today is that when the president does submit that plan, when the administration does submit that plan, that if that plan does not come into balance within a reasonable period of time, 10 years, I think any American would say would be a reasonable period of time. If it does not come into balance, give us an idea as to when you think that will happen. After all, when there was a campaign being run in 2008, uh, the presidential candidate for the Democrats said that he'll cut the deficit in half in four years and we're still waiting. We would like to see the plan that is going to achieve these goals. Now look, we're also hearing a lot of talk today about the sequester. It's not the purpose of this legislation to deal with the sequester. We did have reconcilia reconciliation bills on the floor of this House in May and then again in December. We had a bill dealing with the expiration of the tax codes right before the August recess. So there were opportunities to talk about the fiscal cliff. I, for one, felt that the delay in the sequester on January 1st was, was not in the country's best interest. These were the cuts that the Congress promised to the American people when the debt limit was raised in August of 2011. This was the promise that was made, and it was a promise that was made by the President. It was proposed by, it was proposed by people within the administration. The bill was signed into law by the President. The President cannot now come back and retroactively veto a bill that's already been signed. This is settled law. And these are cuts on which the American people are depending. They're depending on us to keep our word. It's very difficult to cut spending. It's very difficult to cut the budget. Every line in the federal budget has a constituency. Every line in every appropriations bill has a constituency somewhere that cares deeply about that language being retained. 
So an across-the-board cut, when all else fails, an across-the-board cut may be the only way that you can ever achieve that spending restraint. Now, I understand that the White House does not agree with the Republican House that there is a, that there is a spending problem. They think it's a revenue problem. Well, great. Put that in writing. Put it in the budget. Tell us when that revenue that you wish to achieve will bring this budget into balance. I, for one, don't think it's possible, but I would like to see the, I would like to see the academic exercise that they would at least try to get to balance at some, at some point in the future. And then just finally, Mr. Speaker, can I, can I just say, and I, I hate to do a history lesson, but uh, when the Republicans were in the minority in this House, there was a very large bill that was passed, and it was called the Affordable Care Act. This was a bill that did not receive a hearing in the House of Representatives. To be sure, H.R. 3200 had received a markup in a hearing in the House, but H.R. 3590, although it had a House bill number, was not a House bill. It was a housing bill that passed the House of Representatives in July of 2009, went over to the Senate and was completely changed in the Senate Finance Committee. And this was the bill that came to the House of Representatives on which we had to vote in a very short period of time. No amendments were allowed. It was a very closed process. I was in the Rules Committee that night. I remember the ranking member being there and all of the good ideas that I thought I brought forward were all excluded from discussion. So don't lecture me about the process that this bill was, was rushed and didn't have a hearing. For heaven's sakes, we have a bill that is now signed law that cost $2.6 trillion over the next 10 years that never had a hearing in this House. That's the travesty, and that's why we have to deal with spending. I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Georgia Reserves, the gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized. We respond to the gentleman from Texas by saying he's wrong. He's wrong. He's on the Energy and Commerce Committee. The Affordable Care Act had hearings in the Energy and Commerce Committee and markups. There were m multiple hearings on that bill. I'm not sure what he's talking about. And to the gentleman from Georgia who says that he didn't mention you know, the fact that the president missed the deadline, I thought he did, but the bill that he's touting here mentions it in his very political-inspired uh, findings. Read your own bill. It's three pages long. I know, it's, I know that may be too much, but we're all talk to, to, told to read the bill. Look, rather than being here telling the president what to do, he's going to submit a budget. We've got to do our job, and our job is to avoid this sequestration, because if we don't, there are millions of people in this country who will be without work. There are programs that will be arbitrarily cut. This economy will be hurt. Now, if you want sequestration, then you can continue to take your recesses and, and do this kind of trivial stuff on the House floor. But we ought to be finding a way to avoid going over this sequestration cliff. At this point, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to yield two minutes to the gentleman from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee. Texas is recognized for two minutes. My friend from Massachusetts is absolutely right. What most America is waiting for is for us to address uh, the very abyss that we put ourselves in, the cliff that we put ourselves in. Uh, the fact that we became hostage to this idea of a commission that was necessary because we could not get members from both sides of the aisles uh, to be able to work together and what should be cut. And that was particularly because my friends on the other side of the aisle had uh, members who did not understand how government functioned. The Republicans did not understand that government, in fact, is a rainy day umbrella, that we are supposed to serve the American people. So while we are fiddling, uh, one could say that Rome is burning, or maybe they can say uh, the cities and towns of America are asking us to finally answer the question. Under the, the laws that we uh, adhere to, the president has a right to submit his budget. That should be very clear. No legislation here on the floor is going to dictate the president's budget. There is a law that says it's supposed to be the first Monday in February. We will admit that. But what president has ever had, what president has ever had the hostage taking of the debt ceiling so that you can't write a budget if there are individuals in the Congress that won't do the normal business, which is to raise the debt ceiling so that the American people can be taken care of. As we speak, however, the president has introduced today a short-term fix to avert the sequester. The Democrats have offered uh, a way of averting the sequester. We have nothing from the Republicans except a resolution that says a request for a plan. The very plan that the president knows by law he is going to submit, as long as he knows what is the amount of money we have to work on, and of course the budgeting process is going through the House, the chairman of the budget, Mr. Ryan, the ranking member of the budget, Mr. Van Hollen, we all know the regular order, we're going to do our work. 
but putting us on the floor today and ignoring what we should be doing. I'm saddened that my amendment that indicated that I wanted to make sure that the most vulnerable in any budget process, 15.1 percent of Americans living below poverty line, which includes 21 percent of our nation's children, I wanted to have a sense of Congress that whatever we did, we would not do anything to harm these vulnerable children who, to no fault of their, their, their own, that they may be suffering uh, from uh, the kind of economy or their parents are uh, uh, suffering so that they live in poverty. Whatever we do, we should not do anything more to make their life more devastating. May I get 10 seconds? I yield the gentleman 10 seconds. Generally recognized. My other amendment had to do with the estate tax to raise revenue, and that would have been the reasonable debate to address what we can do to make the lives of Americans better. Request a plan. A plan is not action. The president does a budget. We do a budget. Mr. Speaker, let's do our work and help the American people and avoid the sequester. I yield back. General Ace, time's expired. The gentleman from Massachusetts reserves. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself 30 seconds to, to say Jones. to my colleague that I share her great passion for America's children and protecting America's children. And I would say to my friend that I don't believe we can continue to operate under budgets that borrow from those children, not just this year, not just next year, but forever and candidly say that we're protecting them. We are putting our most vulnerable at risk with these deficits. And we have to make the tough decisions. Be happy to yield. Gentlemen's time's expired. Aisle, I don't think anyone on this side of the aisle is not prepared to work collaboratively on the question of the deficit, uh, on the question of growing America's economy, and working with our children. Can we find common ground that indicates that we must invest Gentleman in George's our children at the same time that we are likewise talking about debt and deficit, and that's what the Democrats are talking about, investing in our children, making their lives better. I yield to the gentleman. Thank you. The gentleman from Georgia reserves. The gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized. We, we all want to make sure that our, our children are protected, but uh, in, embracing a sequester that cuts things like Head Start, uh, that's, no, that's no way to protect our children. At this point, I'd like to yield two minutes to the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Courtney. The gentleman from Connecticut is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in 23 days, by law, an indiscriminate chainsaw is going to go through all quarters, all sectors of the American government. Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta on Sunday, al along with General Martin Dempsey, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, very bluntly warned this country that if sequestration goes into effect, America's military readiness is going to be damaged in a very critical way. The Navy has told us specifically what this means. 23 ships will, whose repairs are scheduled will be, will be canceled. 55% of flying hours on aircraft carriers will be canceled. 22% of steaming days for the rest of the U.S. fleet will be canceled. Submarine deployments will be canceled. Today, right now, we have the USS Stennis, the USS Eisenhower, stationed in the Middle East, making sure that our allies, Israel, Turkey, critical missions like protecting the Straits of Hormuz, they have to have aircraft that can fly. They can't cancel. 55% of their flight time and expect to, to carry out their mission. Yet in 23 days, because of inaction by this chamber, we are putting, again, America's national security interests at risk. The Bipartisan Policy Center, founded by Bob Dole and Tom Daschle, has told us we will lose a million jobs if sequestration goes through. So those shipyards that are planning to do that repair work, they're basically going to get layoff slips. And we are debating a bill today that has absolutely no connection to those realities. This is a pure political stunt. It has no bearing in terms of whether or not the military readiness of this country, whether the economic recovery that's on, a, on a, the right direction right now is going to be protected and preserved. That's our job. That's what we should be focused on here today. And denying the Van Hollen Amendment, which would replace that sequestration, is why this rule must be defeated. defeated. And I urge the members of this chamber to vote no on this rule. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman from Connecticut yields back. The gentleman from Massachusetts Reserve. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I'll yield myself such time as I may consume to Gentleman's recognized. read from the President's inaugural address. It took place just outside our back door here. He said, we must make the hard choices to reduce the cost of health care and the size of our deficit. He didn't say we should make the easy choices, because there aren't easy choices left to make. Every single one of them is hard. And I have such great respect for members of this body that have taken the hard votes and made those hard decisions. 
All this bill says is, Mr. President, put your budget where your speeches are. Make the hard choices, any of the choices you want to make to balance any time you want to balance. But we can't begin to pay down the debt until we stop running up the debt. And we have yet to see a budget from this president that puts us on that path. I reserve. I want reserve. Senator from Massachusetts. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, uh, I'd like to uh, yield two minutes to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Deutsch. The gentleman from Florida is recognized for two minutes. Will you get a speech? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today disappointed that my amendment to the Require a Plan Act has been left out of this rule. This bill is bad political theater. Not even the devastatingly dangerous Ryan budget could achieve the balanced budget in 2014 this bill demands of the President. Setting this silliness aside, my amendment would address a separate issue. This bill's use of the phrase unified budget and the inclusion of Social Security as part of that unified budget. This is a blatant attempt to nullify Social Security's historic independence from the federal budget. Social Security is funded by the payroll tax. It was created with its own revenue stream, so these hard-earned benefits would never fall victim to the political shenanigans of a Congress like this one. As President Franklin Roosevelt said, quote, with those taxes in there, no damn politician can ever scrap my Social Security. Mr. Speaker, Social Security is not an item in the budget. It is social insurance that protects all Americans against destitution due to old age, a disability or illness, or the death of a breadwinner. Workers have built up $2.7 trillion in the Social Security Trust Fund, which ensures that benefits will be paid in full at least until the mid-2030s. I have called for small adjustments to strengthen Social Security for the long term, and I'm ready to have that debate. But to put Social Security on the general budget's ledger as, Americans, as America's largest generation retires is simply beyond the pale. This bill, Mr. Speaker, puts Social Security on the GOP chopping block. This is a dangerous precedent. We cannot allow the accounting tricks in this bad legislation to endanger the Social Security that keeps so many Americans financially secure. President Truman, Mr. Speaker, said, and I quote, Social Security is not a dole or a device for giving everybody something for nothing. True Social Security must consist of rights which are earned rights that are guaranteed by the law of the land. Close quote. Today, Mr. Speaker, these earned rights of millions of Americans are in jeopardy, as is that guarantee. We must vote down this rule, and we must vote down this bad bill. I yield back. Gentleman, time's expired. Gentleman from Georgia is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield myself 60 seconds to say no to my friend that I know his commitment to Social Security is, is heartfelt, and it's one that I share. I hope it gives him comfort to know there's absolutely nothing in this legislation that changes any of those commitments uh, that he read there on the House floor. In fact, I would say the opposite is true. As someone who's going to retire after Social Security is projected to have gone bankrupt, I think it's critically important that every budget we look at looks at how it is we're going to pay back all of those government bonds that this Congress has swapped the cash in the Social Security Trust Fund for. Without paying back those bonds, there is no Social Security check to go out the door. The reason we talk about balanced budgets is not because numbers are important. We talk about balanced budgets because commitments are important. And we cannot, we cannot meet our Medicare commitments. We cannot meet our Social Security commitments. And everyone in this body knows it. Every budget the President produces shows it. But we can do better. And working together, we will do better, Mr. Speaker. I reserve. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from Massachusetts. Is speaker, I may inquire from the gentleman from Georgia how many more speakers he has. I'd say to my friend, I'm prepared to close. Well, I'm, I'm prepared to close as well, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Gentleman's recognized. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, this is a very frustrating debate, and in large part because it's much ado about nothing. What we're doing here today is a press release. It's it's it's, it's doing nothing at all to avoid this. Uh, prospect of sequestration in which arbitrary cuts will go into play. This is, this is just more talk and talk and talk and talk. Again, it's one of the reasons why the American people are so frustrated with this place. They want less talk and more work. Uh, we should be working. We should be coming to some sort of agreement to avoid the catastrophe of sequestration, but instead we're doing this. 
Uh, Mr. Speaker, I just want to, I want to put some things in perspective. The Center for American Progress uh, reported that since the start of fiscal year 2011, President Obama has signed into law approximately $2.4 trillion of deficit reduction for the years 2013 through 2022. Nearly three quarters of that deficit reduction is in the form of spending cuts, while the remaining one quarter comes from revenue increases. Congress and the President have cut about $1.5 trillion in programmatic spending, raised about $630 billion in new revenue, and generated about $300 billion in interest savings for a combined total of more than $2.4 trillion in deficit reduction. That's a quote from the America Center for American Progress. So three-fourths of the deficit reduction we've achieved so far is from spending cuts. But my friends on the other side have the nerve to continue to claim that Democrats are, quote, loathe to, uh, qu uh, to end... Uh, uh, to, uh, to, end, uh, to, to agree to spending cuts. I mean, give me a break, Mr. Speaker. Uh, give me a break. If CBO projects federal deficit, the federal deficit to be about $845 billion, which I think is very high, but it's the first time the nonpartisan office uh, forecast a deficit below $1 trillion. So we are going in the right direction, uh, and the President wants to continue to move in that right direction in a fair and balanced way. Now, here's the deal. Uh, my friends uh, keep on referring to what they did last year, which again was last year. We, gotta, we, we have to get them to think about this year because they have to act now. It's a new Congress. But last year, the proposals they ca came up with to try to bring our budget to balance uh, were all about lowering the quality of standard, lowering the quality of life for our citizens. They, th their budget proposal uh, ended Medicare as we know it. Ended Medicare. It's gone. My friend from Florida talked about Social Security. Their plan for Social Security is to privatize it. You know? And, you know, and deep reductions in cuts to provide support for people who are most vulnerable. That's their, that's their plan. And now we see, because we're not trying to address this uh, latest fiscal cliff, I think they really do want a, uh, the sequestration to go into effect. I think that is outrageous. I think it is going to be damaging to our economy. But what their, their plan by allowing sequestration to go into effect is basically to try to balance the budget by making more people unemployed. You know, we will lose jobs in the defense sector, that's already happening, but then we're going to see uh, you know, loss, uh, losses in, in jobs in other areas. There'll be cuts in education, police grants are cut, payments to Medicare providers are cut, and the New York Times reports that even the aid just approved for victims of Hurricane Sandy will fall under this sequesters act. I mean, this is, this is how we're going to solve our budgetary problems? Yes, we do have a big debt. A lot of it has to do with these unpaid for wars, with these tax cuts that weren't paid for. And it's going to take us a while to get out of it. But as we get out of it, we can't destroy our country. We need a balanced approach. We need to cut where we can cut. We need to raise revenues where we need to raise revenues. But we also need to invest. You know, cutting the National Institutes for Health, which will happen if sequestration goes into effect, will not only cost jobs, but it will prolong human suffering. If we could find a cure to Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease, not only would we prevent a lot of human suffering, you would end up solving the budgetary challenges of Medicare and Medicaid. There's a value in investing in these things, not arbitrarily cutting them. Now, last night in the Rules Committee, we tried to bring some substance to this debate. Mr. Van Hollen had his, uh, his amended, amendment, which was blocked. The one substantive thing that we could have done here today to avoid sequestration was blocked. So, Mr. Speaker, if we defeat the previous question, I will offer an amendment to the rule to ensure that the House votes on Mr. Van Hollen's replacement for the sequester, which was, again, blocked last night in the Rules Committee. I ask unanimous consent to insert the text of the amendment in the record, along with extraneous materials immediately prior to the vote on the previous question. Objection. Mr. Speaker, again, I would urge my colleagues uh, to reject this rule, which again is, 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 is Ill, Ill, illustrative of, the, of how closed this process has become in this House. We ought to reject the rule because it is not open. Uh, the Budget Committee never even considered this bill. Uh, but we ought to also reject the underlying bill because this is nonsense at a time when we should be doing something real to avoid a real catastrophe in this country to avoid something that will have an adverse impact on our economy. Instead, you know, we're all fiddling why Rome is burning. This is outrageous. We can do so much better. We ought to work. You know, you're, you're passing resolutions asking the president to do X, Y, and Z. We ought to pass a resolution to instruct us to do our job. And that's what we ought to do. That's what the American people expect. 
So, Mr. Speaker, I urge my colleagues to vote no and defeat the previous question. I urge a no vote on the rule, uh, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back.